Hi, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Postgres today here. Uh, really quick show of hands, who already uses Postgres? Awesome. Who does not? No one? All right, if you're too shy, we can chat afterwards. Happy to convince you. Um, anyone know who said this? <laughs> so I take the exact opposite of this philosophy. This is from DHH. Um, the database, I think it was actually it's just a dumb hash in the sky. Um, we'll get into a little bit of why I think like you should know a little bit about your database, even if you're not a DBA, to work better with it, um, how to deal with it and handle it at, at really any scale without having to go you know, back to school, take a bunch of database courses. Um, really, this is the like 101 with a lot of links and references to, to treat it a little bit better. So first, a uh, little bit about me. Uh, I was one of the first product managers at Heroku, spent about uh, five and a half years there, primarily built and ran Heroku Postgres. Um, we ran around 1.5 million Postgres databases across a team of about eight of us. Um, so I think a pretty good ratio of database to engineer. Um, ran product for Citus Data. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Citus uh, later, but the short is we turned Postgres into a distributed sharded database, and it's transparent to your application. Uh, we were acquired uh, right out a year ago, so now I'm at Microsoft. Um, if you like Postgres and want to learn a little bit more about it, I curate a newsletter, Postgres Weekly. It's pretty highly curated, similar to like Ruby Weekly and others, that um, it's not 100 things, it's like here's the top 10, 15, 20 things, really targeted for like an application developer, not the DBA crowd. Um, so I think this is you know, representative of the show of hands in the room. Um, I think everyone's hand went up. Um, Postgres is more popular than ever. Um, it's kind of the, the largest open source database, I think, growing in popularity. Um, if you look at like Hacker News, who's hiring, I don't know if you count that as a barometer of success or not, but like who's hiring Postgres ranks number one among databases. Um, it's really well loved, really well liked as a relational database. Now, First, this is a, a really fun excerpt from the Postgres mailing list uh, from 2006. Uh, Tom Lane, anyone know who he is? Any, any hands? So Tom Lane helped create TIFF. He was on the board for creating the spec for JPEG, co-authored libjpeg, co-wrote the spec for PNG, then co-authored libpng. Then he said, I'm kind of tired of images. I'm going to go work with this database thing. And he's been working with Postgres for about the last 15 to 20 years. He is the primary contributor to much of Postgres. I think if you look in top open source contributors, uh, he's in the top five or so. Um, this was him 14 years ago on the mailing list coming back from a conference. Uh, and now it's pretty well regarded is that, you know, this is the biggest mistake Postgres ever made was its name. Uh, it's not Postgres SQL. It's not Postgres SQL. Uh, just ignore the SQL part. Like Postgres, Postgres QL is fine. Postgres is perfectly acceptable. Just go with Postgres. Um, it's still painful to this day. And I, uh, I'm kind of thinking about starting a campaign with all the core developers calling it Postgres to annoy them until they go and change it. Don't think it's going to happen, though. So if you're new to Postgres or someone asks you why do you like it, to me, this is the, the TLDR. Um, I think a, a lot of you know engineers, we jump onto a bandwagon, oh, it's cool, of course I'm using it. And if you ask why, we maybe actually can't give a good answer. Um, it's a really, really feature-rich database. Um, I look in like data types or something that I'm actually really excited about. Um, you wouldn't think that that's something that jumps out as, in terms of a database, but it's really useful and powerful. Um, transactional DDL. So if you're running a migration and it fails, you can actually roll it back and not have it kind of be mid-migration. Um, foreign data wrappers. You can connect from inside Postgres to another database and query it directly. So if you have stuff in Redis or Mongo and you just want to interact within Postgres, you can query directly to those other databases. Uh, Listen Notify is PubSub directly inside your database. Um, so a lot of these things on the list, if, I'm not going to cover all of them in the talk. Uh, if you're curious about any of them, happy to chat afterwards or go look them up. Um, all of these really, really awesome features. So first, just a little bit of background on, on Postgres. Um, it's unique as open source, and I would actually say it's probably unique as an open source database. Uh, I think we actually see you know, within Rails, like there is no owner necessarily of Rails. 
Um, it's a very liberal license, uh, which is rare for databases. You can take it, modify it, resell it. Uh, this happens a lot. You look at things like Greenplum, Redshift, Astrodata, and Ateza were all originally Postgres. They took it, they changed it. Now it's got some slight semblance of Postgres down in there. Doesn't look much like Postgres anymore, um, but uh, a lot of popularity in academia because you can go and create a PhD project on it, ship it, change it, do whatever with it. Uh, the community is interesting. There's a, a core team that's kind of like a steering committee. There's a committer, uh, which is actually only about 40 people that have a commitment to Postgres. Um, this has actually doubled over the last three years or so. Um, so it was even smaller. Um, there's major contributors, minor contributors. So you can actually contribute a lot to Postgres without getting a commitment. Um, in terms of mailing lists, like Postgres, everything happens on a mailing list with a patch. Um, there's no central like git repo pull request type model. Um, it happens like it has happened for the past 20 years. Um, if you want to learn a little more on Postgres, the PG SQL users mailing list is a pretty good one to go and learn things. Uh, if you want to fall asleep at night, the PG SQL hackers list uh, is the place to go. Um, really, if you want to get deep into Postgres, like it's where they're talking about deep kernel things. Uh, it's fascinating, and I don't understand half of what they discuss on there. Um, but if you want to level up, it's a great place to go and subscribe. So Postgres is pretty regular with a yearly release. You'll see that every fall. Um, it used to be there was a 9.2 was a major release, 9.4 was a major release, 9.5, 6. Um, usually there's one marquee feature. Now we've shifted the numbering scheme so that major releases are a whole number, no point. So 10, 11, 12 are all the equivalent of the 9. something. Uh, minor versions are released with security fixes, patches, usually about once a month. Sometimes it's every two months. Um, Usually there's a marquee feature. Uh, for 9.2, it was JSON. Um, we kind of cheated there. Like we said, hey, we're a JSON database. Um, and we did JSON validation and threw it into a text field. Everyone was really excited about that for a while. Um, then we got JSON B in 9.4. Uh, B stands for binary. One of my colleagues says it stands for better. I prefer that version. Um, that's a full binary representation on disk where you can query directly into it, index it. Really, really powerful. All right, so let me drill a little bit more into like the features and why Postgres. So data types. Uh, I've mentioned to me this is one that stands out as really unique. I think stands apart from other databases. Uh, Postgres has a very liberal approach to new data types. There's around 100 data types supported. Um, a lot of these, if you're using them in your application, there's a really strong case that you should go ahead and use it directly within your database. I think of something like arrays. If you've got arrays in your, your application, why actually join that to some table when you're actually making things more expensive? Why not just put that into an array? Um, categories, tags, really useful for those kind of data types. Um, JSON, JSONB, I mentioned those. Both really, really useful. Um, you usually want JSONB if you're doing anything with JSON. If you're just actually capturing a bunch of like API, um, you know, log data, that kind of thing, and you want to preserve the white space, preserve the format, you're not going to query on it that much. JSON is really useful. It's not as much overhead, really, really fast. Uh, Timestamp TZ, really useful. Uh, who likes working with time zones? <laughs> Postgres takes care of a lot of that heavy lifting. Um, so to be able to get it back something in a local time zone automatically um, to kind of shift time zones, that sort of thing. Timestamp TZ, really, really, really useful data type. Um, I'm missing a few on here. Uh, UUID, handy. If you're using them in your app, put them directly in your database. Range types. If you're doing anything, again, back to time. Like Time apparently is really hard to work with. Uh, if you're building a calendar application, if you've ever built one, uh, it's really painful. Range types have a from and a to directly in the data type. So you can, can have constraints. Like We can't have more than 100 people in this class at this time. So you can have a constraint that says, you know, you can't have classes that overlap, and you can't have more than this many students in this kind of bucket right here. Really, really useful. Uh, it's really feature rich in terms of its SQL support. Uh, common table expressions, also kind of known as with clauses. Uh, who likes writing SQL? Quick show of hands. There's a few hands. Who likes reading SQL someone else wrote? I, I think I saw one person there. 
We, we should talk after. There's something probably wrong with you. Um, it's, SQL is a very powerful language. It is not the most elegant language. Um, CTEs are really, really, really nice for making readable SQL. I promise you I could go and write a 200 line query that you could parse and follow. Think of it like as a, a view that's lived for that period of the query. So you can have these building blocks that build on each other, make it really, really, really easy to follow. Um, you can also, you know, comment the SQL inline as well, really, really simply with CTEs. Um, window functions. If you're doing things where you want to like suborder things, like find a rank based on some category, uh, really useful. Functions. There's hundreds and hundreds of functions. If you're trying to do something to manipulate the data, like find out what day of the week it is, or shift things by one hour, really, really useful that you can go and just probably have a function to do this sort of thing already in Postgres. So indexing. Uh, if you're like me, um, so I actually have a minor in CS, but I don't have a major in CS. I don't work on the internals of databases every day. Um, I go to the docs when I want to add an index and I you read and I have no idea what's going on with all of these. Um, the super simplified version. So a B tree is usually what you want. When you say create index, a B tree index is what's going to be created. If you learned about an index in, in CS, it was probably this. Then what happens within Postgres with Almost every major release now, we get a new index type. Um, there's a group within the, the community known as the Russians. Um, one of them is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Moscow and hacks on Postgres for fun. We have very different definitions of fun. But um, he, he'll go and read some paper, say this can be really useful for this specific data type or this specific uh, data structure, or when you have this distribution of data, this is really useful and it'll give us a 10x improvement. For the first couple of years, everyone's like, okay, great, sure, we have indexes, we're not worried about it. Um, he kind of went off three months later, showed up with a prototype with numbers, and it's like, oh, this actually works, really cool. Now when they show up, we kind of expect them like, yeah, this is crazy, but it's gonna work, and we're gonna see it in the next release. So we've got uh, Jin. Really useful if you're working with JSONB arrays, you can think of it as having you know, multiple values within a single uh, column. So you're packing in a bunch of values, JSON, keys and values directly in, really useful. Uh, GIST, really useful, simplified way is full text search geospatial. You can think of it when you've got values within a row that might overlap other rows. So if you think you've got a sentence, there's part of this sentence that applies you know, here and you've got another row that has another sentence. Part of that sentence could overlap. Um, or polyg polygons, where you've got points and you want to find, hey, does it overlap within this one or that one? Uh, SPGIST, um, I ask every core developer every time I see them what it's good for, and they literally just say phone numbers. So that's all I know. Um, really large data sets that kind of naturally cluster together. I've asked for another practical use of them, and they've yet to come up with one. So for now, if you're dealing with phone numbers, you probably want SPGIST. Um, and then Bren, uh, block range index. It's really useful for really, really large tables. And I'm talking billions and billions of rows and things that will naturally cluster together. Most of the time, you just want B-Tree. Sometimes you'll want Gen and Gist if you're doing things with like JSON arrays, uh, geospatial stuff. All right, so a few people like writing uh, SQL. Who likes writing procedural SQL? No one on that one? Um, so it's really powerful, but there's another option within Postgres, uh, PLV8, which is the full V8 JavaScript engine embedded directly within Postgres. Really powerful, so I can go now and write you know, procedural JavaScript to do whatever I want. Um, I have a friend that jokes about creating like a two-tier application so he can just execute all the JavaScript directly in the database, just figured out how to, how to, how to get Postgres to respond to web calls. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but really useful when you need to do more advanced things and you want a uh, slightly better language than, than uh, procedural SQL. And then extensions. So. More and more Postgres to me is becoming a data platform. Like it used to be like a relational database meant a very, very strict thing. And those bounds are kind of changing. Um, Postgres moves really slow and stable, but Postgres is unique and it has this extension framework. Uh, so you can have low level hooks that change the behavior of Postgres. So you can write new data types, you can write new indexes, you can write um, things that will take your data and just write it to dev null. So you can write a, run a really fast benchmark. Um, these are really low-level hooks that allow it to completely change what Postgres does. One of the biggest ones, PostGIS, so PostGIS has its own huge ecosystem community of its own, 
Um, it's a massive extension. Uh, PostGIS is regarded as like the most advanced open source geospatial database. And it all basically goes and hooks into Postgres and extends it with new data types, new functions, uh, all sorts of things. You want time series. There's multiple time series extensions. Uh, if you want to migrate from Oracle over to Postgres, there's an extension that will basically help with all that compatibility. So really, really powerful ability to go and change what Postgres does and extend it without us having to wait for uh, you know, a new release within the core. To date, there's about 100 extensions or so. New ones show up kind of every week. If you're looking to do something that you think Postgres can't do, take a look at the extensions that exist for it. Um, so a couple of pro tips. Um, if you use a terminal, PSQL is really, really good. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Um, how many of you have like a bash RC set up? Okay, most hands. How many of you have a PSQL RC set up? We're, we're drinking together after and hanging out. Um, so PSQL is really, really powerful and awesome. You can do things like bash flush x auto, which will auto format your text based on the width of your screen. So if it was going to wrap, it's actually going to go split those lines up one by one by one. Uh, backslash timing will automatically turn on the timing for every query and tell you how long it ran. Really useful. Um, I actually have mine set up that will record the history of every query I run against the database. So if you've ever had someone come to you and say, hey, can you give me a report of you know, how many user signups we had last month from, from Birmingham? I you know, hop in and I write this query, send in the report, great. And then they come back six months later and say, hey, you remember that report that you ran for me six months ago that was really, really useful and I have no idea what they're talking about? Um, because I saved the history and it's saved in a file that matches the database name, I just have to reconnect to that database, uh, control R, and search back through my history, start typing, and I'll automatically populate with that query. So I never lose a query against any database I'm connected to. Really, really, really handy. Um, and it's all set up in my PSQL RC, so I don't have to do anything extra. It's just automatically there. If there's really common queries that you run, you can name them. Um, so if you've got a 100-line SQL query, you can actually name it and then just execute the name of that, uh, how you name it, and it'll run that query for you. Really useful. If you're not a CLI person, um, Azure Data Studio, I recommend is uh, you know, kind of evolving, improving, uh, more GUI interface for Postgres. Anyone here not convinced on using Postgres? All right, hopefully it's a good case for it. Uh, if you need more reading or need to convince someone else, um, there's a couple of articles. Um, but this talk is really about Postgres at any scale. So I actually just covered kind of think a bunch of the things that you care about with really, really small data. And I say small data, less than 10 gigabytes. If you've got a, a database that's smaller than that, Postgres is pretty much going to handle it. You don't have to do anything special or extra. Um, you want to leverage your data types. Do this early. Um, go ahead and start using arrays and the timestamp data types, uh, JSONB. Start putting indexes in place gradually. Uh, back up things. Get a backup strategy going. Um, test it. If you haven't tested your backup in the last six months, um, I'll bet good money it's not going to work. Um, I don't know if everyone saw the, the GitLab incident that was, I think, about a year or two ago now, where they supposedly had five different mechanisms for backups, and none of them work. Like, it, they were down for hours, lost data. It was painful. If you haven't tested your backups in the last month, please just go home and do that. Uh, see if it works. Um, and then spend some time getting your environment right. Go ahead and set up your PSQL RC. Save your useful queries. Um, set up your history now, and it's a lot easier than when you know, you're in a crisis and, and triaging something that it's already set up for you. All right, so let's get on to a little bit more medium scale. So you've got an application, you've had some success. Um, I'm going to say this is about you know, 10 gigs to 100 gigs, uh, a few hundred gigs. You can even say this is maybe up to the terabyte scale. So uh, here you're going to sort of want to hear a little bit more about performance. There's going to be some key metrics you're going to pay attention to. I do this on a weekly, monthly basis, or when things get slow, periodically come in. Um, the first thing you're going to want to pay attention to uh, is your cache hit ratio. I'm really excited for DuckTales is back with my kids. So this uh, really quick cryptic query is just going to give you back a really simple number. And it's going to show you the amount of times that your queries were served from cache or memory versus going to disk. Um, what you're going to want here is to see 99% or higher. Uh, 
Uh, if you're less than 99%, like those, those queries when you're at 99% are often going to come in you know one, two millisecond kind of time frame. Uh, as soon as it goes from like 99% to like 98, you're going to fall off a cliff, and you're going to see 10, 50, 100 millisecond kind of time for your queries. Um, anytime I show up to a database, this is the first thing I'm going to check and say, you know, what's my cache hit ratio look like? If it's too small, uh, you either want to do some indexing or you want to go get a bigger database. Just go get a bigger one. It's the easiest thing to do in terms of scaling databases. Uh, a little more nuance is your index hit ratio. Um, so when you issue a query, by default, Postgres is going to scan every single row in that query. Um, what you want to do is if you've got, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of records, you don't want to scan every single record that's going to take a while. So you want to do is start to leverage indexes for your popular, popular queries. This is going to give you a list of all the tables in your database, the number of rows, and the amount of time you used an index. Uh, really, really useful to come in and say, okay, am I appropriately indexing things? Um, do I need to go in and change some things, et cetera? And then unused indexes. So I, uh, just for fun, tweeted a query, because I could fit it into 140 characters, that would generate SQL to create an index on every column uh, on every table in your database. Uh, don't actually do that. Like, yes, every query will be fast, but you're going to be able to insert like one record per second. Um, but you can be pretty liberal with indexing. Like, if something's slow, go ahead and add an index. But it's useful to come through every so often, every month, two, three months, and, and get rid of ones that aren't being used. Uh, and Postgres actually is really good about keeping track of all of these things, like which indexes are used, which ones aren't, um, how many blocks are dirty, all these sort of things. Um, so you can come through here and actually see that, hey, we've got this index that has not been used in the last six months, and just drop it. Really, really useful so you can get some performance back on the right side. Um, so some rough guidelines. Uh, any new database, your cache hit ratio, keep it above 99%. As soon as this drops below that, it's time to go get a bigger database. Uh, index hit ratio, this one varies based on the size of the table a little bit and your, your workload pattern. Um, generally, I would say 95% or higher on you know, any sizable table. Uh, 10,000 rows is a decent record, could be 100,000. Um, tables that are maybe 100 records, you don't need a great index hit rate necessarily. All right, connections. Um, connections in Postgres are a bit of a, a sore spot overall. Um, every time you go and grab a new connection to your database, like there's TLS negotiation, Postgres isn't perfect at this. Like the time to grab a new connection, I would estimate is about 50 milliseconds. It could be less, it could be more. Um, so what typically happens is you, you know you set up a a pool with an active record, and it's going to have a bunch of connections for you. A new request comes in, it says here's one from the pool. Now, this is a bit of a problem because when you active record goes and grabs a pool automatically, if it's you know five, ten connections for kind of each web server you're running, um, that's a lot of wasted resources. Um, every connection, even if it's running a query or not, consumes resources. It consumes about ten megs of memory, um, and then when you get to hundreds and hundreds, there's various lock contention and that sort of thing going on under the covers. Um, idle connections in Postgres are basically just bad and wasted, and you don't want them if you don't have to have them. But we want fast connections, so we you know, turn on our application side connection pooling. Um, here, PG Bouncer is really an ideal thing to, to add to the stack. Um, what PG Bouncer is going to do is take all of those idle connections and just make, make them disappear. It's going to have its own pool, but it's not going to pass things through until you start to run a query automatically. Um, so if you're running a production application, I would definitely recommend this if you have any sizable workload. Uh, I've talked to people before that said, you know, hey, I need 3,000 connections to my database. Uh, can you raise the limit from 1,500? Um, and I'm like, do you really need that many? Like, that's a really, really big production application. Uh, yeah, 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 we have this many active to our database. Uh, we hopped in and ran a query, and there were 13 active connections on the database. Um, so several thousand idle doing absolutely nothing, just wasting resources. Um, so to kind of get an idea, right, like PG Bouncer is going to sit right there between your database and all of your different Rails servers. Uh, you're going to connect to it just like you would to the database. PG Bouncer is basically going to wait for that query to start. If it's a transaction, it's going to hold it all all the way through, begin until you commit. 
If it's a really quick query, it's just going to pass it right on through. Um, it's going to make everything much, much healthier. So if you run into connection issues at all, or if you're at you know, 100 connections or higher, and you're not running PG Bouncer, I would highly recommend it. And that's mostly it for, this, for the medium scale. Like, add some indexes, watch your cache hit ratio, when things slow down, add more memory. Um, it's a pretty good and robust database. Um, if you're looking to optimize specific queries, PG stat statements is a really, really useful tool as well. Um, PG stat statements will show you every uh, query that's ever been run against your database, uh, how many times it was run, and then how long it took in average and in total. So you can go and find like really, really bad offenders there. So an another really useful tool for that medium scale. As you get a little bit larger, you're going to want to shift your backup strategy a little bit. Most people are just going to do a PG dump once a day. Um, this is a, a logical backup. It's really useful for pulling something from you know, production down to staging or to your local machine. Um, it's basically like SQL and more or less raw insert statements. Um, now, it does have some load on the database. Um, so you, when you run this, you're going to run it at night when it's off peak, so you know, there's not a huge performance hit. It's really good for less than 50 gigs. It will not work at a terabyte. Um, it might work at 100 gigs. It might work at 200 gigs. Um, there, you're going to want to ship to a physical backup. If you want to use something like PG Backrest or Wally, there's a bunch of tools. It's a little more overhead to set up, which is why I say like you don't necessarily need it right away when you're at 10 gigs. Um, when you're at 50, 100 gigs, really, really useful to shift your backup strategies to start to use physical backups. Um, this is going to be the physical bytes on disk, and then stream the Postgres write ahead log uh, to something like an S3 or Azure Blob Store that you can then replay it. And so I mentioned this at the you know, smaller scale, middle scale, applies at large scale. Like If things are slow, add more cache. Um, if your cache hit ratio falls below that 99%, go get a bigger instance. Um, it's the easiest thing to do for scaling a database. Now, at some point, you can only go so large. Like There's only an instance so big. Um, they do keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, but at some point, you're going to have to start to say, you know, break out data. Um, one option is deleting data. For most businesses, that's usually not a great option. Um, so here, what you can do, uh, the quickest, easiest thing is to start to split out some reads to a read replica. Um, if you have things that are like uh, business reporting or analytics, those are great against a re read replica because they're not competing for the same workload. Um, pulling out... Uh, Usually when you get a really, really large database, there's one table and it's either called logs, events, or messages. Like if you have one of these tables in your database, it's probably the largest one in the bad offender. That may not need to go in there with all the rest of your application data. You can pull that one out. Um, then you can start to you know, split things up or when at really large scale, shard. So sharding, uh, in the most simplest terms, is just splitting your database up into smaller bits, um, smaller, tinier parts. Going to walk through uh, Citus a little bit. So Citus is an extension, pure open source. You can drop it in, and it's going to turn uh, a bunch of different Postgres databases, turn them into a distributed uh, setup. To your application, it still looks like a single node database. So you don't have to go rewrite in a bunch of application logic. Um, so if you had like you know a events table, and we were to split this up, it would create like an events underscore one, events underscore two, three. Spread these out across multiple physical nodes. Uh, when you query, you're just going to query events just like normal. So sharding is just the process of splitting this up. Usually you've got to build some application logic to handle this. Uh, Citus is one extension that just handles it for you. So here, what's going to happen? And whether you're using Citus or something else, you're going to want to hash your data up front. So you're going to want to go and define a number of shards. Say like 128 shards is a, a decent number. Um, you're going to want to find these buckets ahead of time. You're not going to want to go and like, create new ones every single day. Uh, I see a lot of people that start with sharding and say, OK, I'm going to put my first 10 customers on this box. And I put my next 10 customers on another box and my next 10. The problem with that is your first 10 are your, the ones with the most data, the most valuable, your, your long-term customers. Um, so you've got new customers coming in that have no data. And you've got this one really, really large instance still. So, Better to actually hash every user ID that comes in and put them in buckets. So you're going to divide up the, the hash space of whatever you create um, and split that up. 
so that by default, customer one, two, three, four are all in different spots already. Now these are just tables under the cover. So you're gonna create a lot of shards. And one important note is a shard is not equal to a node. Uh, a lot of people I see like, oh, I'm gonna create two shards because I have two nodes. Um, shards will end up being a table within Postgres. So you're gonna have like 128 shards or 128 tables. So you're gonna split these across two different nodes. So you have 64 on one, 64 on the other. Why this is helpful and important is when you outgrow those two nodes that you have, you're gonna go and add two more nodes. And it's really easy to copy 32 tables from one node over to the other than it is to go and copy data out of a table and break that up. So you're gonna to to have a bunch of smaller tables already. And then you're just gonna route them accordingly. So as it comes in, what's the hash ID of this user? That goes to node three, send them there. Now, scaling relational databases is hard. You've got a bunch of relations and models. You've got a bunch of joins. Um, like if you're a CRM, you've got leads and accounts and opportunities and all these join and interact. Um, how do you know, aggregate from one section to the other? Um, how do you make sure something's completely transactional when you're going from one node to another in a distributed system? So all of this is actually going to be made a lot easier by co-location. So what you're going to want to do is define some really high level shard key that everything can shard on. Um, for a lot of like, if you're a SaaS multi-tenant kind of application, it's probably like customer ID or tenant ID. Really, really common. You're going to want to actually put this on every single one of your tables and group them together. So if I've got like a you know customer ID, I put that on every table. All of these tables are going to live together. So I've got customer ID, and then I've got you know the leads and accounts and opportunities all for customer one. All those are going to have the same resulting hash value because customer ID is one. And so I'm going to start all those tables together and co-locate them. So I've got all the resulting hash ranges of this together, which means I can actually join them again, uh, which I couldn't in a easily distributed fashion. So all those are split up. I've got 128 shards of each of my leads, my accounts, my opportunities tables together. Now for things that you can't uh, necessarily shard and, and split up, um, what you're gonna wanna do is create like a reference table. And here you're gonna do a two-phase commit across all of these. This is really common for like a, a categories if you have something like a you know state mapping or zip code, something like that. Really, really useful. And you're just gonna wanna have uh, this typically be less than 100,000 records, definitely less than a million, because every time you write this data, you're gonna have to write it to every single node and make sure it's a, a, a proper two-phase commit transaction. Um, but then you can join these things. So even if something there is, that, there's a table that you can't shard, you can actually distribute it across all nodes and, and join it. Um, now with sharding, you really don't wanna do it until you have to. Um, so I would say, you know, look for things that are killing your cache hit ratio, like n plus one queries and consuming resources. Um, when you're, you're really maxed out and your cache, you're at the largest instance, your cache hit ratio is low, look at offloading things to a read replica for like the BI, the analytics, things that can have some latency, don't have to be real time, can lag by, you know, an hour, a few minutes, that sort of thing. Uh, that'll give you more runway. Um, when you do need to shard, um, I talked to a bunch of people that you know tried to shard 10 years ago and five years ago. I think the landscape has changed a lot. Um, if you tried to do it 10 years ago, you probably still have nightmares from it. Uh, but then there's now use cases like Instagram, which sharded when they were eight employees and managed it pretty successfully. They got a number of talks about it. Um, look at the guides and resources out there. Uh, it's not as painful as it used to be. Um, yeah. All right, so really quick recap. Uh, small, medium-sized databases, watch your cache hit ratio, number one. Um, use indexes, um, use the right indexes. Like that primer should give you a pretty good guide. Um, add 100 connections or more, I would highly recommend uh, putting PG Bouncer in place. Uh, is anyone here using PG Bouncer in production? A few hands, okay. Um, it's, if connections have ever been a pain for you, point for you, maybe worth going back and looking at. Um, and please test your backups. If you don't have a backup that you tested in the past few months, uh, you probably don't have a backup that'll work and that'll bite you one day. Um, for, for larger scale, modify your backup strategy. Uh, identify the right sharding model. This is actually good to do early, like uh, adding a customer ID onto every column, every table. 
uh, if you've got like a multi-tenant app, could be good to do when you're small. So then you don't have to go and backfill that later. You don't have to shard, but then when the time comes, you're, you're ready for it. Um, and then identify a co-location strategy that kind of works so you can maintain all the transactional consistency, joins, reporting, all of that. And then still do everything you did early on. And that's it. Thank you.